hello there. We'll be doing more tutorials like this over on Patreon. It's only two dollars a month, so consider supporting us. All right, so delete the default cube, shift A and add a plane. Adjust the dimensions in the top right corner to scale it to whatever you want. Here I chose to go with the standard paper dimensions, which is 8.5 inches by 11 inches. Once you got that, go to the material tab and add a new material. Click on that little circle next to base color and select image texture. Click open and now just pick your paper image. I have these confidential like files that were made in Photoshop, but honestly you don't need anything super fancy for this method to work good. Click on the viewport shading mode so you can see the applied texture. You may or may not be greeted with this weird stretched out version of the paper. The reason this occurs is because the texture is on a different axis from the dimensions of our plane. So to actually make it look like paper, there's multiple ways you can fix this. But for the simplicity of this tutorial, I'll show you the two easiest ways. The first and slightly more complicated way is to mess with the UVs. This just gives you more freedom in how you want your image to appear on the plane. So go up to the UV editing tab, select the plane, and hit tab on your keyboard to go into edit mode. Now in the texture image window, drag select the image while in edit mode. You can position the image in any way you like now. If you have the same problem as me, you can just hit R to rotate it, and to rotate by increments, hold control while rotating. You'll see the degrees in the top left. Once you rotate it to the position you like, you can just hit S to scale it properly. But in this case, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to show you the easier way of just changing the dimensions. So hit tab to go back into object mode, and then go up to the top right again and just switch the dimensions around as need be. My plane could use some more adjustments in the scale, but it looks good enough for me. Now on to the details. So go over to the shading tab, you may have to zoom in on your paper, as we are using real-world measurements. You'll be presented with the node editor. Before we get into that, right here I'm turning the viewport shading tab into more of a real-time preview like Eevee. So you can either do this, or just go to the render view mode, which is set to Eevee by default. Let's add a light by hitting Shift A and selecting point light. We can start adding some details with the node editor. So shift A, go to converter, select color ramp, and plug that into roughness. Select the node which contains our texture, and shift D to duplicate it. Now you can plug it into the color ramp. What we're doing here is creating fake maps just using data from a base texture. So next we're going to fake a normal map using a bump node. Shift D to duplicate the texture again. Shift A, go to vector, select bump. Plug the color into the height, and the normal into the normal. You'll see our paper get a grainy look. This is where you can start to adjust things on the bump node until you're happy. Real quick, as a personal preference, I'm going to change this light to a warmer hue, and also go to the world settings and change the background to black. We can also go to the render settings and tick these options to make things look even better. Although, when recording, I accidentally ticked freestyle, which you shouldn't click for this type of thing. I end up addressing that at the end of the video. Also, a cool little tip. If you ever need to get close to your object, go to the top right view settings and turn the clip star all the way down. Okay, back to the details. So for this certain paper texture, inverting the bump makes certain details pop out in a more realistic way, such as that coffee stain on the paper. So that we can actually see how the nodes are affecting things a little better, let's position this light differently and make it harsher against the plane. To fix that shininess to the letters, invert the black and white markers on the color ramp by sliding them past each other. It makes things look a lot more natural. If you want to deform your paper a little, make sure it's selected. Go into edit mode, click A to select every point, and subdivide however many times you need to. Now if you click the proportional editing icon while in edit mode, you can select a vertex and any adjustments made will affect the geometry surrounding it. What I'm doing here is hitting G to move the vertex, and then Z to move it along the Z axis. 
I'm using the scroll wheel to make that circle smaller. That circle tells how much surrounding geometry is actually being affected. Just mess with things until you like it. To fix this grid-like pattern on your paper, select your plane, right-click, and click Shade Smooth. Here's how I got my paper looking, just slightly curled in some parts. We've covered everything in terms of making the paper look pretty, so now I can show you how I set up the framing. First, I wanted to add another paper under this one for some depth. Shift D, hit G and then X to drag it to the side along the X axis. If you have a separate texture you want applied to the second plane, then go to the Material tab and click that little plus next to your materials. You can rename your first paper texture material if you want. After clicking the plus, add a new material, repeat the same steps as the first paper with adding an image texture, but just choose a different image. Once you do that, you'll probably wonder why it's not showing the new image texture on your second plane. That's because you need to go into edit mode, hit A to select all the geometry, and over under your materials, make sure you have your new material selected, and click assign. Everything will look plain again, so we need to repeat the steps with the nodes, but we can easily just copy our simple setup from the first paper material. So select your first plane, make sure you're still in the shading tab with the node editor, and drag select your color ramp and bump node only. Hit Control C. Then click on your second plane and hit Ctrl V in the node editor to paste the nodes. Now just Shift D your image texture node twice and plug them up as they were on the other plane. You'll now have your second paper looking as good as the first one. What I'm going to do is position this paper under our first one to give the illusion that it's laying over it. Drag it over and rotate it however you want. We can just use the proportional editing again to move certain parts of the paper down, just enough so that it's not clipping with the first paper. If you're doing this in Eevee, by default you won't get contact shadows, which is an effect that can really sell your renders. As you see, it shows in cycles, though. But you can actually turn them on in Eevee if you click on your point light. Click the Light Settings tab, click the drop-down arrow on Shadow, and enable Contact Shadows. Make sure you turn the bias all the way down when working with small-scale scenes. In this case, we will turn the radius of the light to zero to give us the harshly implemented shadows. I will also move the point light up a little so that the shadows aren't being casted as oddly. If you go to the render settings, you can see the bloom option I turned on is creating that glow effect on the paper's surface, similar to the way the moon refracts light from the sun. You can mess with the settings or just turn them off completely like I decided to for now. Here I wanted to lift this part of the paper up a little so that it casts a slight shadow and better separates the top paper from the one below it. I decided to add a paper to the top right corner overlaying our focus paper as well. Another cool thing you can do is add a volume shader for a hazy effect. I decided not to go with this in the end, but I think it's at least worth showing. So shift A, add a cube, and make sure it's scaled up so that your scene is inside the cube. Then make sure you're in the shading tab and that the cube is selected. Shift A, go to shader, and select volume scatter and plug it into volume on the material output node. You can mess with the volume scatter to make things appear more or less foggy. And to get rid of the blockiness in the fog, go to your render settings and turn the viewport sampling up until it's smooth. So now, Shift A, let's add a camera and frame the scene. Press 0 on your number pad to see what the camera is seeing. To move the camera around easily using Blender's default controls, Go to the View settings in the top right while you have your camera selected, and click Lock Camera to View. Just position it to where you like. With your camera selected, you can go to the camera settings on the right and change the focal length if you need to. I'm still not happy with the way the light is looking, so I'm going to change the power of it so it's not as bright. 
And something cool you can do in Eevee is change the falloff distance of the light by clicking on Custom Distance and tweaking the distance slider. The best way to add depth of field is to use an empty so you can control where the focus is. Shift A, go to Empty and select Plane Axes. If you want to change the size of the empty so it's not as distracting, go to the empty settings and simply change the size. Okay, now go to your camera, go to the camera settings and enable depth of field. Click focus on object and select the empty. You can see that the middle is now in focus and the edges are slightly blurred. You can drag it to where you want the camera's main focus to be. You can also bring the empty close to the camera if for some reason you want things to be out of focus. You can even animate the position so that you can emulate a focus pole. I'm going to reposition the camera. If you need to get super close to an object like I am here, you can turn the clipping off by going into the camera settings and turning the clip star all the way down like we did in the view settings. You can just keep on adjusting things even further once you get a composition you like, so just have fun with it. I feel like a very simple thing many tutorials haven't covered is working with multiple cameras. First select your camera, shift D to duplicate it, and just move it wherever. Now if you hold control zero with this second camera selected, you can switch to this camera's view. It's as simple as that. You can see that this camera is reacting to the original depth of field empty that we created. So you can duplicate that, drag it to where you want, and just repeat the steps we did with the previous camera and empty. To stay organized, rename the empties to depth of field. You can adjust the lighting for this camera too if you want. So now go to whatever camera you want to render out first. We're going to go over some basic render settings. Go to the Scene Settings tab on the right. If you want a different resolution, you can change it to what you desire. But I'm going to keep it at 1920 by 1080. If you start getting into animated scenes, you can change the frame rate, and you can also select where your render outputs to. To render our scene, you can either hit F12 or you can go up to the top left under Render and hit Render Image. It rendered in almost no time for me since I'm using Eevee. An image like this will take longer using cycles. In the top right you can see this line. This is the mistake I made earlier when accidentally checking options in the render settings. So go to the render settings, go to freestyle, and uncheck that if you haven't already. Now when we render, there won't be that line there anymore. Also, there's this problem here in Eevee where it cuts the shadows off at the edge of the image. I haven't found a fix for this, but what I do is just scale the image up slightly in Photoshop. I'm going to reposition this camera for a final render. If you want to save this image, just go up to Image and Save As. Let us know what other tutorials you'd like to see and how we can improve on them. Thanks for watching.